Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shramoy Mitra, and I'm the director of Stamps Gallery, part of the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. Stamps Gallery is a center for contemporary art and design at, uh, in downtown Ann Arbor. Um, the gallery it builds on the school's strong tradition of excellence, thought leadership, and community engagement. Uh, we develop innovative and scholarly exhibitions, publications, and public programs that foster inclusive platforms for presentation, discussion, and inquiry into the urgent questions and concerns of our time. The gallery functions as an incubator and lab for artists and designers to explore explore ideas and projects that catalyze positive social change. Excuse me, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that Stamps Gallery and the University of Michigan resides on the traditional and present day territories of the Three Fires people, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Bodewadami. As we work, live, and play on these territories, we recognize the ongoing effects of colonization, community struggles for self-determination, colonial violence and uh, indigenous sovereignty. This summer, Stamps Gallery is proud to present Halal Metropolis, a meaningful and ambitious exhibition organized and curated by Stamps professor and artist Osman Khan, Stamps MFA candidate and photographer Razi Jaffrey, and historian and professor Sally Howell, which explores facts, fictions and imaginaries of Muslim populations in Detroit and Southeast Michigan, as viewed through historical research, documentation of current conditions and explorations of future desires. I want to convey my deepest gratitude to each of, to each of you, Osman, Razi and Sally and your team Asma Baban and Moje for your hard work and dedication in realizing this important project. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome three wonderful chefs, chefs Chef Omar Anani, Warda Bugetaya, I'm so yeah. sorry, Warda. No, that, that, <laughs> um, that was perfect. <laughs> uh, Mamba Hamisi, who will leave us feeling very hungry, I'm sure, um, uh, and yearning to try their food, which I'm sure, you know, which I encourage all of you to do. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Sally Howell, uh, to join us and introduce the panelists. Thank you, Sramoy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I thank everyone at the Stamps Gallery at the University of Michigan for being such gracious and supportive hosts of the Halal Metropolis exhibition, um, exploring the history, politics, and aesthetics of Muslim visibility in Detroit. To us, the Halal Metropolis alludes to the established and growing Muslim population in Detroit and its metro area, one of the largest and most diverse Muslim populations in the United States, whose visibility is both pronounced and extremely present in the city, and yet whose narrative seems unusually silent in the larger Detroit story. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this virtual gallery talk, uh, focusing on these three Muslim culinary champions with their groundbreaking uh, restaurants, um, and the, all three of them are entrepreneurs and they're dynamic food activists uh, from Detroit. Before I introduce them, I want to ask those of you who are joining us live to please drop any questions you have in the Zoom Q&A box or the Facebook comment section, and we will do our best to get to, the, uh, to get to them during the conversation. For those of you joining us on Zoom, I want to bring your attention to the live transcript button on the bottom of the screen. Please click it to see the closed captioning for this talk. I also want to say thank you to our sponsors who include the Knight Foundation, the Doris Duke Foundation, the El Hibri Foundation, and the Andy Warhol Foundation. I also want to welcome our three guests. Um, who I'll, I will introduce briefly before we get started. Uh, Chef Omar Anani is a Palestinian Egyptian American restaurateur. He is the chef owner of the James Beard nominated Saffron de Troyes, an award winning modern Morocco, Moroccan bistro on the east side of Detroit. His food truck, the Twisted Mitten, was the first halal food truck in Michigan and has been recognized as one of the best food trucks in the country by USA Today and the Food Network. 
Chef Omar's culinary background includes a degree in culinary arts and experience at fine dining establishments, including Michael Simon's roast and in kitchens across the globe. His food trucks and brick and mortar restaurants have featured cuisine from multiple cultures, fusing flavors and textures from all around the world. Um, in 2020, Chef Omar launched the Saffron Community Kitchen Initiative to provide meal relief to Detroiters in need. For his efforts, he was recognized by Our Detroit Magazine as one of 10 Our Detroiters who are enriching life across the region and was featured by the Detroit Free, Pre Free Press as a food fighter. The Saffron Community Kitchen has provided over 100,000 meals for Detroiters in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome to you, Chef. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, born and raised in a seaside town in Algeria, Chef Warda Bugataya first immigrated to Michigan in 2004 when her husband took a job in the automotive industry here. A few years later, they moved again to Shanghai for three years for another posting. This was when Chef Warda enrolled at the prestigious Paul Bocuse Institute and became an aficionado of French pastry. When the Bugatayas resettled back in the Detroit area in 2016, she began to pursue her dream of opening her own cafe by setting up shop at the Corktown Farmer's Market. In late 2018, with the support of Food Lab Detroit, Chef Warda formalized her business, another step, and opened Warda Patisseria on Gratiot in Detroit, incorporating food from Asia, Algeria, and France into what she refers to as a patisserie without borders. In 2020, just before the pandemic hit, she was named Detroit Free Press's first chef of the year. Uh, congratulations to you. And last weekend on June 12th, Warda Patisseria opened their new cafe in Midtown, which we're all very excited to try. Welcome to you, Chef Warda. Thank you so much for having me. And thirdly, last but not least, I'm really happy to introduce um, uh, uh, the owner of, of uh, Baobab Fair, which is owned and operated by Chef Nadia uh, Nijimberi and CEO Mamba Hamisi, a husband and wife team who came to the United States from Burundi in 2014 as refugees. Freedom House in Detroit helped the young couple and their growing family get on their feet again here in the United States. And the couple was eager to share their culture with Detroiters and to give back to the city that had made them feel so welcome. Not having many options for employment, they decided to start a restaurant serving up food from their homeland. They started with pop-ups and joined the Hatch Detroit competition in 2017, which they won, enabling them to open uh, Baobab Fair early in 2021. Between the two of them, Nadia and Memba speak five languages and they want their restaurant to serve as more than just a restaurant and marketplace. Baobab also serves as a safe space for other immigrants and Detroiters alike. Baobab is one of the few East African restaurants in Michigan, and it offers a variety of specialties from the region, definitely playing the role of cultural ambassador. And it became a big hit this past Ramadan in particular, uh, despite the fact that it opened during the, in the middle of the pandemic. It's Friday Ramadan specials brought together Muslims of all backgrounds in the city. So welcome to you as well. Thank you so much, Sloan. Uh, so I, I thought the best place for us to start um, would be for you to share with us uh, what motivated you to become chefs and entrepreneurs, food entrepreneurs um, in the first place. What inspires your practice? And in particular, maybe you can also talk a bit about the inspirations behind your current restaurant projects. So you can answer in whichever order you like. <laughs> We could go in alphabetical order. Chef Omar, you go first. Dang, okay. Um, <laughs> for me, uh, it was actually a very simple story from when I was a child is when I knew I wanted to cook. Um, my sister moved to America um, when she was about six. And so her dad was remarried. She was, she moved here from Jordan. She's trying to learn English. You know, things were just very difficult for, for you know, a child who's just been removed from their mom and in a new country. And um, I remember one day I was making cupcakes with my mom in the kitchen and I grabbed every candy on the countertop and just smashed them into this cupcake. And it was probably the most hideous thing you've ever seen in your entire life. But to me, it was everything that I loved in one cupcake. 
And so I was like, look, mom. And she goes, well, what are you going to do with it? It's like, I can't eat it. It's too pretty. And in my mind, I went, I took the cupcake, went to my sister and I told her, gave her the cupcake and told her I loved her. And in my mind, that is the first visible memory of her smiling. Um, and it's those memories and those barriers that can be broken down through food um, that really inspired me to be the chef that I am today. And how about your current establishment? This is a lifetime in the works. Uh, you know, my dad said, I didn't move to America and work two jobs and this, that, and the other so that my son would be a chef. You need to go get a college degree. Little did he know, letting me work in his restaurant at the age of 14, <laughs> um, you know, solidified why I wanted to do what I did. But our culture, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that America is so huge or so vast. Whereas if you were to go to Morocco or you were to go to Algeria or you were to go to Burundi, right? The countries are so small, they're the size of a state. And so everyone knows everyone there. And, you know, you, you hear the term, it takes a village to raise a child. And in those countries and in those neighborhoods, it really is the whole village that raises the child where everyone knows everyone. And people are like, well, I can't do this because, you know, my mom will find out because the neighbor will see it, right? And it's that that sense of community and that sense of, of of togetherness that um, is culturally ingrained in all of us um, that really wanted me to take saffron and turn it into a place where people could come and eat. And again, you just break down barriers through food. How about you, Chef Warda? So for me, it's a bit similar to Omar where actually uh, my mom has always been uh, a good cook good baker and the same thing with my grandma and so when I was a teenager my mom would like we would literally like sit together and like kind of imagine menu together and we were thinking about turning our garage into a restaurant <laughs> which is very common like you can totally do it back home <laughs> there, there's no such thing as like <laughs> health department <laughs> or like zoning or whatever you can do it so we would like spend hours like talking about it. Oh, like maybe he's uh, marta or like with meat or like something like that. And then we would just talk about it. And I've always loved uh, cooking and loved baking. And so when I moved here, for me also, it was a way to, um, to kind of stay connected to my mom and stay connected to back home. Uh, it helped me a lot uh, with the homesickness uh and so um so that was that's that's always been something that i was passionate about and um with opening the the word of patisserie i think it's just i've always loved um feeding people um whether it is my family uh, my dad has a sweet tooth so he has always been my number one fan so it was always like to please him how do i get my dad to say yes to anything i want just make him dessert and so um, it was uh, It was for me a way to kind of, um, I wouldn't say like make friends in a country that I don't know, but it actually started like that because like my husband would invite his colleagues over and my English wasn't that good at all. But for me, if I can feed you and that's for me, my love language, I cannot necessarily speak your language, but let's, let's break bread together. That's awesome. I think that's a very familiar story to people who work in immigrant communities because the food it, it brings back so many memories. And it, of course, it's a wonderful way to share culture. So Mamba, how about how about you? Tell us your story. So, I think for, for, for me and, and Nadia, so I came here in November 2015 and then joined Nadia. And uh, at that moment, it was a very rough time for, for my family because we were waiting for asylum for a couple of years and then we didn't see any way we can get out of the situation we were in and then I, I had a business background so I, I, I was a sales and marketing manager in the region uh, East African region so I, I tried to apply jobs around they couldn't get any and then I, at that time I wouldn't speak the language but I tried to see what opportunities because I know how my parents made a lot of big sacrifice to send me to school, which is not 
on in Africa. So I was, and then 2017, we got asylum. That was the beginning. And then I was like, okay, now I cannot get a job. Go back to school is gonna take long. Why not try a restaurant? You know, I have a background, my, my mom owned a restaurant, but it was a small restaurant, like only one, one table, five chairs. Everybody was eating on the street, you know, if she's cooking something and then finished, she's closing the day. It was just to feed us, it was not to make money. She was making, try to make sure like, I have a restaurant, at least my kids, we have something to eat. And then I had that memories. And then Nadia, she was, she liked to cook. I was, I came there one day at home, I was like, you know what? Why, if you cook and then I sell, you know, like, oh yeah, let's try it. So we applied on North, uh, on Hash Detroit, which we didn't even know, to be honest, what we were doing. We just have, want to have a restaurant. And then after we won, that's how everything started. Yeah. Well, you know, so the thing that, that you have in common, the three of you, apart from being you know, running these awesome businesses in Detroit, is that you're, you all have African roots. Um, and I, I just think that's so interesting. And you're, the kinds of cuisine you offer are so diverse. So it's, you're not at all doing similar things, but you've all got these African roots. And so many of the, 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 the chefs that we hear about in Detroit and the, the new restaurants that open, we hear about are people coming from Brooklyn and places like that, <laughs> not people coming from Burundi, you know? So it's, it's just been, I think uh, you have a lot of support in the city for people who are really eager to see all the, the rich, you know, cultural backgrounds that the three of you come from. Um, so one thing I want to ask, because all three of you, you know, come from these, um, from different parts of the Muslim world, um, and each of you makes, makes clear in a different way that the food you serve is halal. Um, so I wonder if there are exp expectations, um, especially maybe from a white centric food world, uh, about what that means. Or perhaps there are also expectations from the Muslim community uh, about, about what it means. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, do you feel that your palate is limited in any way or that the reception of your work is limited in any way by, by the fact that you, 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 you make public that your, your food is halal? I think I can start on that one. First of all, I think both both of us, we took a risk to say, hey, we are not from Brooklyn, we are not from New York, we are not from LA, we are from Africa and we are bringing something because it's easy to sell that narrative that is a chef from somewhere. But look, it is not easy to say it's a chef from Egypt, it's a chef from Algeria, it's a chef from Jumbura Burundi. You know, and then that is what people want to, we want to sell and to tell people these stories, like people from this area, they can do even better. Especially halal for me is, is very common in Africa, you know, Muslim and non-Muslim, they eat halal. Coming in this country, I was even surprised, like there is no, no halal. That means for me, halal is clean. For me, halal is, is, a, a, is a trust, so for me, that was very important to, to, to say, hey, this is who I am, and this is what I'm selling. Go for it, one of you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think for me, it's, um, like you said, it's different. It's, if it's like the, if it's obviously like the Muslim community or the non-Muslim community. But I think with my business, I've always, uh, being clear that, like you mentioned, that it is a uh, patisserie, pastries without borders. So I kind of don't limitate myself in what I can do, uh, but obviously always keep it halal. Uh, obviously for me first, so I can eat it and try it, uh, <laughs> but then also for my customer. And it's also different. If it's like the there will be like some customers who will be like, oh, so which which of your pastries is the Algerian pastries? Uh, and maybe sometimes I'll have it, and then sometimes I won't have uh, any. And um, uh, it's it, but it's it's always been uh, people are you know very open to try whatever uh, we cook or whatever we bake, and um, uh, there's never been any issue with that. So for me, it all comes back down to the history of food. And I think a lot of times we forget um, where food comes from. When you look at the food of North Africa or even Burundi or the Middle East or uh, 
even into Asia, um, a lot of people forget where food came from. Uh, people think that Italians created pasta, mm -hmm. but they learned how to make noodles from the Chinese. Um, the use of spices all came through Silk Road, right? And so we learned from Indians how to make, how to use cardamom and cinnamon. And those things didn't exist in our world back then. Um, even something as humble as the hamburger, which is probably the most American dish on the face of the planet, uh, was not created by Germans like people think. It, it was actually created by Genghis Khan. Um, and so his horseback riders would slice meat and put it under the saddle of their horse and they'd ride their horse all day long. And the bouncing would chop up the meat and the heat and the friction would cook it. And that way they wouldn't have to start fires at night. No, would know, no one would know where the horseback riders were. Um, and so when we look at the history of food and, and, and the traditions that came with all these dishes that we cook, um, it makes it easier for us to give our own interpretations of where those things come from. In terms of just being halal, uh, you know, for a lot of us, I grew up outside of Detroit, right? Um, in America, where prior to moving to Michigan, there was no access to halal meat, right? And this is, as time has gone on, um, you know, 10 years ago, if you were to go out for any sort of form of Asian takeout, people would be like, oh, you had Chinese food. Like, no, this is Korean. Oh, you, you had Chinese takeout. No, this is Vietnamese. And Asians did a really good job of educating Americans of, no, this is not Chinese food. This is Korean food. And now we have Korean restaurants and we have Vietnamese restaurants. And that is the, this revolution that you're seeing in Detroit that you don't see anywhere else, right? Because Mamba's very, very particular in saying, no, this is Burundian food. And when people tell me my food is Mediterranean, I'm very poignant in saying, no, Saffron is a Moroccan restaurant. Oh, it's Middle Eastern. No, it's in Africa, right? And so a lot of people, they think they forget because there was an article written just a month ago, an hour about, you know, the African uh, foods in Detroit. And they mentioned this restaurant and that restaurant and that restaurant. And I was like, they didn't mention Warda and they didn't mention me. And a lot of people forget the Sub-Saharan just because they're not black, they're not African. And, and, and so it, it, all, it all just comes full circle, but, but truly understanding you know, where the food comes from and, and how it all works is, is absolutely amazing. I think that's interesting that you say that the people, yeah, you, they want to put you with the Arabs, obviously. So they want yeah. to put you in Dearborn and then they, the next thing they want you to be cooking Lebanese food, you know? So it's, it's <laughs> uh, I, I completely understand that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I just have my own little halal story on our campus at the University of Michigan Dearborn, our food services, because we have so many Muslim students. So our food services are very, very careful the company is actually a Palestinian owned company, Picasso. And they're very careful about making sure that they have halal options for students. And they have all this signage sort of explaining what it means and what the protocols are and everything. And one day I was waiting in line to get a sandwich made and the student in front of me in line said, you know, she got a sandwich and she wanted a club sandwich, you know, with turkey on it. She asked for the halal turkey and it also came with bacon on it. And so the woman said, well, do you want the, do you want the turkey bacon? you know, which is halal. And she, the girl said, no, I want real bacon. And then, you know, the woman and I just looked at each other and I said, well, why are you getting the halal meat? She said, because it's cleaner, it's better meat. That was her answer. <laughs> she wasn't a Muslim student. She just thought she was getting a better product, you know, if she got halal. So I thought that was interesting. Well, so, I mean, this is something that you, you guys have sort of alluded to so far. A common thread that's found in all your work is the focus on these very different but specific types of culinary traditions that you represent. Um, and all of you seem unbounded in the sources that influence you. I mean, maybe this is less true of you, Mamba, because you're really you know, doing the East African food. But um, we know that the food world has become increasingly concerned about the question of appropriation in professional kitchens and the role it can play in othering or even displacing Muslim and other professionals of color. Uh, but your experiences as individuals and professionals, and professionals have not been confined to any one culinary tradition. Your kitchens seem to celebrate a plurality of cultural traditions. And you know, perhaps as a reclamation, a resignification, uh, gestures of respect, and even as a mode of empowerment. So I just want to get your take on this this sort of um, this conversation that's taking place right now among your colleagues about cultural appropriation and food. Again, I think it's all about 
if you say the way we started here, my mom, when he, she has a restaurant, she didn't have a fridge, refrigeration. She cooked on the, the food on the wood, you know. And it's all about this conversation we are having with people trying to train people who are here and then to tell them what the meaning of the food and then how we make the food, what's, how the respect of the food is, a, as Omar said, I think the, it's all about education. We have to educate ourselves. We have to educate others. We have to tell these stories, which is very important. Like some people, they don't even know, like in Burundi, you have Muslim, you know? Some people, we see from from are you sure you're Muslim? Is halal? I say, yeah, don't worry, it's halal, I'm Muslim, you know? Because these stories have never told before. So I think that is the key of everything is to, you know, to educate people, to talk about all these stories. That, that is my answer for that, Sally. It's like I said, uh, you know, understanding the history of food and where it came from, uh, you know, really defines what is cultural appropriation. If you truly understand a dish and you can pay it uh, the respect it deserves, I'm not the type of person that's gonna be offended. If you try to take the dish and claim it as your own, um, that to me is cultural appropriation. Um, the other thing is like a lot of people will take what they understand a dish to be, right? If I was to try and recreate some of Mamba's recipes, uh, like there's an African dish that I love, uh, chicken yasa. I love yasa, but my yasa doesn't taste like when I make it at home, like actual yasa. Um, and I'm not trying to claim that it's my own thing, right? So if, if you pay the respect and understand the history of where it's from, I have no problems with anybody of any color cooking it. Because at the end of the day, if they're like, yes, this is a Palestinian dish, this is Palestinian food, then that's bringing more attention to Palestinians and Palestinian food, which is good in my book. I, that allows us to open more Palestinian restaurants, more Burundian restaurants, more Algerian restaurants. And that's, that's a good thing. How about you, Warda? I agree 100% with both Omar and Mamba in that uh, if a dish is um, cooked well, respected, and uh, if it is uh, told in the tradition and uh, that it was known for, I don't see any issue with anyone cooking any type of uh, cuisine. Um, however, I feel like, like, especially here in the US, people have the expectation if you come from a certain region that you have to kind of stick to your uh, roots and are expected to cook uh, that cuisine. But if, um, if like a, a, a white chef does it, then it's trendy and hip. <laughs> uh, so there's this like um, conflict that sometimes bothers me. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, and, and it also just, like you're saying, it depends on how you're trained and, uh, and, and all the, the nuance that you're bringing to the food you're doing. Well, Absolutely. So, yeah, th this leads to another sort of a, a, a subject that's dear to the heart of our research that we've been doing in the Halal Metropolis project. So one of the things that we've seen is this, there's a, there's, there's a, a novel hybrid vernacularism uh, that combines traditions um, from various homelands with American culture to produce new visual aesthetics, new tastes, uh, new linguistic forms. We see it everywhere, the garages of Dearborn Heights, which people dress up you know, like living rooms, to the art of some of the artists included in our show. Um, and it's important to note that this is developing as a vernacular. Right, um, it's not artists and designers necessarily who are leading this development. It's maybe not the top chefs like you guys who are leading this development, but but the diverse communities themselves. And I'm curious about your thoughts about this, and um, uh, you know, and how you see how you see this affecting your work. You know, like how this is coming coming back up into your work. I think it's not the bad thing for on my. It's, not, it's a good thing because I've been telling people, I, I encourage uh, people to have more halal food. So halal will have a high, halal food will have a place 
so people will know that not eating halal is not, so eating halal is normal because you have more people. So if people can try to do that, you know, it's a, especially right now when you have like young people who has access on every news, you know, social media, everything, they, they, wanna, they wanna try that culture. They wanna try that thing, you know, which is good. And then again, I'm coming back to say like, this is how uh, this story gonna be, uh, people wanna tell this story. What is that from, you know, oh, this is from here and here. Because I'm sorry to say this, in America, people doesn't know. They know, most of people, they know only about where they live. Here in Michigan, that's all. Be, Beyond that, they don't know anything about other places. And then it's a good thing because you see people are coming to ask questions, which is education, you know, telling stories. I'm, I'm back on my, my point again. I think that is very important. Well, I had never had an avocado dessert until I ate one in your restaurant. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it. Um, how about how about the other two? I mean, the question might seem a little strange, but like the food trucks, you know, Omar, you you apparently had the first barbecue, halal barbecue business in the country. Now we see halal barbecue all over Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, Livonia. I mean, these things are spreading. So sometimes they they move in different directions. So many um, young Arab Americans who are opening businesses today, you know, if it had been in the parent generation, it would have been a Lebanese business, but now they're opening hamburger joints and breakfast joints and all these new things are happening. So this this is, uh, of course, this is just, this is, uh, this is American culture. This is what happens here. We used to talk about the melting pot, but um, I'm just wondering how this influences your, your work and also the audience for your work. I think it, it does quite a bit of both. I think, um, you know, our culture here in America is completely different than the culture overseas, right? And so we have these things that are trending like TikTok and everyone's trying to be viral all the time. And what's new, fun and exciting. And it, and it spurs this complete change. And, and what is food? Uh, it's an art, right? And so just like the, the canvas that an artist would paint on, the plate is our canvas where we do our thing. Um, you know, I remember, was it two years ago now where the chicken sandwich became popular at Popeye's and everyone's like, you need to do a chicken sandwich. You need to do a chicken sandwich. And it's funny because I could never remember the name of this place, but I was in Egypt uh, four years back and I had gone to the mall and there was this chicken sandwich that was literally this big and they would give you poly gloves like the ones you get at Subway and it had like four pieces of chicken and onion rings and coleslaw and the thing was massive, right? And I was like, that thing looks so cool. And, and we eat with our eyes. And I remember before we left Egypt, I was like, I have to go back and try that sandwich. So I had that sandwich and it was mall food. So, you know, it wasn't great, but it looked amazing. So when they asked me to make a chicken sandwich, it's like, I'm going to show them, I'm going to take every flavor of Morocco and I'm going to put it into this chicken sandwich. So use the whole thigh. The thing is massive, bear, bear seasoning, caramelized honey butter, the harissa slaw, some charmoula, like all these flavors. And I put it into a sandwich. And I'm like, there's no way they're going to love this thing. Cause it's just, and they took one bite and they just looked at me. And I just retired the chicken sandwich this year uh, because of how crazy busy it made us and we just couldn't keep up anymore. Yeah. But we looked up the name of the restaurant in Egypt. Uh, my staff did because they're curious because I could never remember what it was called. And it really uh, was called Chicken Hell, which <laughs> funny enough is what I was living. But that is the, that's the, the whole thing about, you know, people moving here, they're, they're not going to stick to, that's like saying, you know what, you can't marry somebody outside of your race because they're not your race. You can't cook their food. My wife is from Bangladesh, right? My, my life is completely different than, you know, at my in-laws than it is at my parents. And, and that's all of who and what we are. I think also the good thing is uh, about all these like young generation who are kind of diversifying and not sticking to whatever their parents is doing is because they're not their parents. Um, they are Americans and they have uh, different um, backgrounds, uh, even though they do come from like the same, um, you know, like the same background of their family, but they, they grew up with different friends and they grew up with different influences. And uh, I feel like for us as chefs, 
it doesn't um, restrain us to whatever we want to cook or bake. And that's also the beauty of cooking. Like you don't want to be restricted to a certain type of uh, food or a certain um, stamp that people put on you. And the funny thing is also like whenever I have my family visiting from Algeria, when they come here, they don't want to go to um, Lebanese restaurant. They want to go to the halal burger joint. They want to go to the halal <laughs> Asian restaurant. So because they know that they won't be able to have this experience back home um, because there isn't any like that. And so it does allow people to try new things. It does also offer to the Muslim community more options. Well, one question that I'm, I'm seeing from the audience is um, is a, a, about this, you know, all, I guess our conversation, we're talking about the same thing and all these things, but one person is asking about um, what you make of what's happening, the the, the recent sort of, um, I don't, and you, you guys haven't all been here for, as, you know, for you've been here for different lengths of time, but in the last few years, maybe if we go before the pandemic in particular, um, there was some really new things happening during Ramadan. Um, uh, so we had um, like Suhoor Fest was started in Dearborn and Dearborn Heights, which I'm sure you, you were all aware of with this big food festival and uh, and often it wasn't the Lebanese food that you saw there. It was the very fancy desserts and um, and the barbecue and the burgers and all those things that were being sold. In addition to the the the, the hookahs for your car, <laughs> all those things. <laughs> but but we saw you know, and even during the pandemic, we saw a lot of the restaurants in Dearborn started setting up sort of like food booths in their parking lots, right, to attract people. Um, during Ramadan. So something is really happening um, late at night during Ramadan for just the idea of suhoor, the idea of sort of turning night into day. In Dearborn, um, a few years ago, they started, um, the, the police started leaving the lights on, the traffic lights at night, because they noticed that on Warren Avenue, there were a lot of accidents because so many people were going out to get food in the middle of the night, you know? And then I noticed that this past year, Mamba, you are, I kept seeing on Facebook so many references to the fact that you had these specials during Ramadan and so many people from the African-American Muslim community, they were just lining up to go get your food um, and really sharing with great enthusiasm the fact that there was some you know, African food for them, to, for them to sort of embrace during Ramadan. So what do you guys think about what's happening during Ramadan? And are you, you know, here in America, here in Detroit, I mean, really something distinctive is happening here and are you do you have plans for for to participate in this i'll go first i was actually super excited when i heard about mamba doing it like i heard about it on the radio and i was extremely excited because it is about it's going back to educating people and i feel like the only way uh for non-muslim people to know about the culture and the religion is the, the easiest way will be through food and so this opens the discussion of what is Ramadan? What is that tradition? What do you do? And it also offers us different options to kind of go and eat to at Mamba's uh, iftar because I don't want to cook tonight. Uh, it's just, uh, I think it's, 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 um, it's absolutely beautiful to see. And even like in Dearborn to, to hear about the festival, uh, it's, it's a great initiative. The more the merrier. I remember doing the halal barbecue truck actually in Dearborn during Ramadan. This is probably five years ago, six years ago, just before it started to catch on and people were doing these festivals and whatnot. And it's actually where I met a bunch of the uh, halal food bloggers um, doing that and, and kind of put my name on the map with the halal community for food. But it goes back to this is, this is my exact point. I just did a pop-up for Palestine uh, a week ago where we raised money for some kids in Gaza. And everyone was like, well, where's the political speech? And where's the religious speech? And where's the this speech? And where's the that speech? And people are like, how are you serving halal food at a brewery? And the whole point of the event was to, again, break barriers through food, introduce people to the word Palestine and Palestinian culture and Palestinian people through food and dance. But the more we normalize these things for Americans, the easier it is for us to have those harder discussions. We have to start somewhere. And so these Ramadan late night festivals and these huge parties, um, 
it allows people to be introduced to what Ramadan is. Like I remember growing up when people, when I was in elementary school and people would see me fasting, like you're crazy. You go how long without food and water? I could never do that, right? And we didn't have a huge Muslim community in, in Maryland, right? But now people are starting to learn and see. And I have friends who are like, I'm gonna try and fast for a day. What are the rules? Let, let me try. And the more we normalize these things, the more we show them that it's not just suffering as they see it, right? There, there's true spirituality and fun to it. And there's, you know, at the end of the rainbow, guess what? We get to go to Mamba's at three in the morning when everyone else is sleeping and we're gonna party and eat some delicious food and it's gonna be great. And I was like, wait a minute, we get to party all night? Oh, let's go get dessert. Dude, it's four in the morning. Yeah, yeah, all the bakeries in Dearborn are open. Let's go. And those, those are the cool things where we normalize that practice for, for other people to understand who and what we are. Well, my, myself, my, I, I didn't know that Detroit has a big, huge com black community, Muslim community. I didn't know that. And then until we had this uh, Friday iftar, where you saw people from the community see, they feel like, oh, thank you so much for bringing this in Detroit. We didn't have any place in Detroit where we can go and eat and have iftar. You know, you can't, I can't tell you how that feels when you say, look, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the answer for some, for a question which was there for a long time. It's like, you, if you don't go, if you can't go to Dearborn, you can't go get the food, you know? Now we feel like we can, invite people from Dearborn. And then some of them, they, we used to invite people from Dearborn. Now we have a place in Detroit, so where you can have iftar. So, you know, again, as uh, Omar said, it's all about to show people and tell, this is normal. It's not nothing special, this is normal, this is how it should be. And then I remember when I was at uh, Omar's event, from far, I saw people with hijab in the brewery, in the bar, I was like, wow. This is what I want to tell my kids, that these people can live together, can uh, support one cause, you know, because there, is, there was that connection of people who wear a job and then someone was drinking alcohol, but they're talking about one uh, cause. And then I think that is a very good, uh, very good uh, message to tell ignorant people who are out there. Uh, this is this is really interesting to hear. So we have some some more questions for the audience. I'm just going to read a couple of them together, and then you guys can answer them as you choose. So one of them, one person, um, uh, says that it's asks if it's difficult for you to observe halal as chefs in certain spaces, like at other events or events, I guess, outside your restaurants and with other chefs. Um, do you feel excluded in the, sometimes for this reason? So that's, that's one question. Then another one is, um, I've read a lot about uh, restaurants not being lucrative businesses, um, though you're all incredible entrepreneurs. What challenges do you experience as restaurant owners? And I think that this also gives me a chance to just bring in something. This past year, I mean, there's never been a year like it for restaurant owners, for your industry, um, it's just been an incredibly horrible and challenging year for you. And yet each of you, Mamba, you and your wife opened a restaurant this year, which I don't understand how that happened myself. Warda, you were able to grow into a new space, which is awesome. And Omar, you really pivoted your energy toward providing you know, food for people who were in need. So I think the three of you have just done amazing things this year. So maybe in addition to talking about the challenges, um, you might talk about this particular year and what a challenge it's been. But Omar, you really wanted to answer that first question. So maybe maybe you could go to that one first. The first question was the, the one I'm about sorry. being a being a halal chef in spaces and you know like <sighs> like in the like in the bar like in the brewery. You know for me I'm a classically trained chef and so um I come from an arena that Mamba and and what that don't have to deal with right so I I was nominated for a James Beard just before the pandemic hit. And for those of you that don't know what James Beard is, it's like winning an Oscar for a restaurant. Um, so to be nominated for best new restaurant in the country for a chef is like this culinary dream, right? And uh, and all that got taken away. But when you're in, when you live and work in those spaces, you always you always have to innovate and do new things and see what other people are doing. And it's very hard for a chef 
to go like, okay, well, I want to do an ode to this, that, or the other. And so sometimes it is very hard. But what you have to remember is it's what you make of it. I don't think there's a single restaurant on earth that doesn't offer a vegetarian option. Mm -hmm. So if you are strict to halal and, and you go, you know what? I'm just going to have the vegetarian dish. I'm still going to eat. I'm still going to enjoy the company. And again, it's all about, you know, who you're spending time with and, and what that time is about. And if you're sitting here hung up on, I really wanted to try that, that, that dish, but it had bacon on it. A lot of places will allow you to remove the bacon or, you know, you can make, you can make certain um, changes to help. If, if, if our religion teaches us anything, it's that sacrifice now for the later. And that's what we do when we go out to these restaurants where we can't have something, right? Are there parts of those those questions you want to ask? You don't have to answer that one. You could talk about the challenges of being a an entrepreneur in if either you know if you want. You know, restaurants don't make a lot of money. A lot of people. There's a reason why eighty percent of restaurants fail. Um, it's a game of pennies, and so yeah. the average restaurant is only pulling in five to ten percent profit. You go, oh, that's a lot. Well, if a restaurant does 10 million, uh, let's say $1 million in sales per year, which is a ton of money, and they're only making 5% profit, and they're spending 100, 200, between 100 and 120 hours a week at their restaurant, what life is that that you're living, really? Um, and I've always said, I've told my wife a million times, I go, if the restaurant ever becomes in the way of our marriage, I'll shut it down, because there's more to life than this restaurant. And, um, you know, it's a passion, but it doesn't define who I am. And a lot of people, you know, they, they come to this business like Mamba has a passion, Warda has a passion. And, uh, but I know that that passion doesn't define who they are. Uh, it's not, Mamba is probably one of the most amazing fathers I've ever seen, right? And, and he likes, ask him about his kids and just watch his face. Uh, you know, it's more than the restaurants that we own. Uh, it's, it's more, like my great, 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 great grandfather is Ahmad ibn al-Khattab. So anybody who knows who that is, um, I have big shoes to fill in my life. I have a lot of things that I have to do, these humanitarian things. I still don't even hold a candle to the things that he did for, for our people. So sorry, I just, you can <laughs> skip to someone else. So yeah, as uh, Omar uh, um, Omar said, I think for, for for it's very it's very personal what you are doing here because you personally, I remember three years ago I was trying to get a job. Now I, I'm I'm in that position where I can hire someone. That means a lot, you know. That is powerful, you know. When you you are you are applying something and then they are saying no 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 your English is not good. We are sorry, you know, you, you can take this training, the, the way to push you up. But now we are able to create jobs. That is one. Another thing is like opening the middle of the pandemic and then you see how the community, how people are excited, how people are coming to support you. That is another thing. It's like, it's beyond. I remember when we started, this was just for me and Nadia and our kid to survive as my mom did. After I was the country like Burundi, the Africa. Now we don't we don't own the restaurant anymore. This is for people in Detroit. People are coming and say thank you for bringing this here. So it's not all, now. It's not only me and Nadia and the kids. It's the whole community. You know, I think that is challenges are going. You can't even count hours. Sometimes I'm here until Omar knows this when I'm making the dresses. Sometimes I'm here until like one. 2 a.m. I have to wake up in the morning and to get the kids ready to go to school. That is what seven. And then, but at the end of the day, when you see these results coming back, you know, people say, thank you for bringing what you're bringing. You know, you're like, yes, this is, this is what I should do. I think the challenge is, is common, like for all of us as to like, running a business during the pandemic, um, we all have the same challenges. I mean, for me, it's um, it's the same as Mamba. It's like, how can I 
live this family work balance because yes, it is my passion, but no, it is not my life. My life is my family and my life um, are my daughters. Uh, and so it's always a struggle for me and I'm not there yet of like, how can I make enough time for my work and enough time for my family and enough time for myself? And it's this continued like struggle of like how to have a balance in my life. At the end of the day, like Mamba mentioned, it's, um, it's, um, it's, you want to make people happy. And then when you have like this feedback of seeing people happy and bringing a smile to your, to their life, and then they will send you messages like, oh, my mom loved this, whatever pastry you made. For me, it's the biggest reward. Uh, it's definitely not about the money. If it were about the money, I would have closed a long time ago. Uh, it's really about pushing. Uh, it's really about creating something beautiful for, for Detroit. Um, and also, and we talked about it a couple of months ago with Mamba about the baraka in, in our religion, in our culture. And it's something that we hold on to. Like there's a blessing in everything we do. And uh, even when there is a struggle, we know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So we always try to focus on that light and not on that dark moment that we're in. So that's actually what, um, what kept me going. We, we have the term, the hospitality industry, which is kind of like, a, uh, I mean, it's a kind of a, it doesn't mean the same thing in English that it means in Arabic. <laughs> I mean, karam and, and the Arab world has a really different meaning than, yeah. but, but I, I do feel that um, like when I was in Mamba's restaurant a few weeks ago, you know, I could see the way he was greeting everyone who came into the restaurant. He knew so many people who came in and I saw, you know, when you drove up to the restaurant, you could see cars on the street that had African flags on the hood or African license plates, or people were wearing t-shirts with a different country's flag. I mean, it's clear that people feel welcome in this place. They feel at home in this place. They feel, you know, they feel like they're being seen and heard and, and cared for in this space. And so I, I, I absolutely do see the, the baraka that you're talking about that there is a kind of grace to these places that goes above and beyond you know just it, it's not a gift shop you're running <laughs> you know it's a different kind of business yeah. uh, well so uh, uh, toward this end one of the questions that we've we've gotten um i need to go back and read it so i can maybe do it justice is um uh you know, so the three of you have faced challenges, but you've also been really successful in, in your careers. And I think, um, you know, do you have any advice that you would want to share with young people from, from, from Africa, young people from, uh, from the Arab world as well, young people from any background um, uh, who, who are interested in, in, uh, in going into this line of work? Like what, what advice would you give them? Um, what are you, what is your think? I mean, you, you've kind of shared the, the, the challenges of it, I think, but what advice would you give? I think for me, I'll go first, Omar. I think for me, it's uh, to work hard uh, and to surround yourself with the right people too. It's extremely important, whether it is your team, whether it is your community, because they will lift you when you're down uh, and also dream big. There's no, there's no limit to whatever you can do if you put your heart into it and if you have the, the right people around you. And sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> sleep is very important. <laughs> Don't develop the habits that people like Anthony Bourdain had of getting through the night by using drugs. <laughs> no. yeah, for, me, for me, if I go, I would say my weapon was uh, the passion. To be patient, that was my, that was the key of, of this journey because I feel like I, I was not something I had to learn, you know, and then something I have to work hard. Uh, but I think that was my, this is my advice for young people, no shortcut, just patience, step by step, you will not get there one day. Yeah, again, as what I say, you work hard and then have that patience. It's going to pay out one day. Yeah. 
I think the industry is changing a lot, uh, especially right now when people had time off from work to reevaluate their life and their lifestyles. Um, and us as restaurant owners, we had to reevaluate how the industry sits. Like a lot of people don't know, one of my main missions is to uh, eliminate tipped wages. It's extremely important to me because most people don't know that tipped wages came from slave owners not wanting to pay their slaves. So what they did was they go, well, they're going to work for free and they're just going to earn tips. And that's how we're going to pay the slaves, the former slaves. And uh, it wasn't until way, way, way later that they initiated this $2 in some sense change per hour with the tips. And when you come into this industry, um, there's a lot of negativity that comes in the, like you said, we're, the three of us are very lucky. We work in a halal space, but the industry as a whole is very much um, a lot of alcoholics, a lot of drug users, a lot of, um, I think all the fine dining kitchens I worked in, uh, I don't think there was one where there wasn't a cocaine habit by at least half the kitchen, not even half, I mean, you know, less, but, but still the point being, those are, those are the, the things that come with this industry. So if you really want to get into this industry, make sure you pick a place that has the same core values as you. Make sure you get into a place that has the same beliefs as you. Um, and it has nothing to do with culture. It has everything to do with, I know that Mamba and I know that Warda and myself, it, at our core, our restaurants are about community. They're about hospitality. Um, and, and, you know, halal happens to be one of our core values as well. But when, find a place where you will fit in that's going to teach you the right things, but also allow you to feel validated in the work that you're doing and, and learn and absorb as much as you can. That's my advice. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it's clear that the three of you do take this really seriously, that you've not only do you create community in your restaurants, not only do you have good relationships with your colleagues and have that teamwork, that sense of community, but you, in order to succeed as entrepreneurs, you've also really had to create community, sort of reach out into your communities to, you know, to create really positive vibes and, and relationships. And I just want to shout out to my team members on the Halal Metropolis project <laughs> that I know because we've been kind of through the ringer working. We're not it, we're not entrepreneurs in the same way. We're sort of we're cultural entre entrepreneurs. Um, uh, you know, we're, our livelihood is not this project, um, but it's certainly a, 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 a labor of love and passion. And the fact that we've had you know it's like good team members that we really share values with, and we're sort of pulling the same load. We're working in the same direction. That's made everything about this project just just I mean we I feel lifted up by this project and by having such good uh, good partners and and collaborators so I think that the advice that you're giving is is it, it's wonderful advice regardless of what your career is <laughs> regardless of where you look you know you want to have people who who share your values so um let's see I have one more question um um so we'll here. So I'll just read. We have a few questions here. <laughs> so one person's asking um, uh, uh, wants to go back to the cultural appropriation um, issue a little bit because they said that this last year during Ramadan, some of the halal taco um, places that that were that popped up this last year um, were. Uh, people were accusing them of cultural appropriation. Um, and so one person's asking, are halal tacos appropriated or do they give Muslims who observe halal access to a new kind of food? Uh, another person's asking, um, they want to know your, your shout outs, what restaurants you would shout out um, in Southeast Michigan. Um, one person's asking, how have the places that you've lived influenced your work? Um, and are, the, are there certain dishes that you've created in homage to some of the you know, specific places that you, you've lived? And then finally, one more, um, uh, one person's asking about audience. Are there, um, are, are your audiences, you know, are the audiences for your food primarily halal food eaters? Um, um, especially given the fact that your restaurants are all, you know, none of them are located in an enclave, you know, in, in, in the Muslim enclave in, in any way. So again, whichever way you want to answer that. <laughs> I can start with the last question. I think for us is not even, we have diverse people coming in from everywhere. They're not, not, not only Muslim. And then even if Muslim, they can feel like, they're in a safe place where they can eat everything, but 
we have people from all over, as, as we said before, because they think like, even in Halal, if it's not Muslim, they feel like it's, it's, they have that, you know, they, if they feel like it's safe, it's clean, you know, they can trust. Uh, yeah, I think we, we see people from all over. Anybody else? I, my location, uh, I'm actually, what, like a mile or two away from one of the, but I'm further north from downtown. And so my location is very much a, a food apartheid region where uh, I don't like to call it a food desert because there's plenty of opportunity to open and nobody's opening. Uh, it's a completely, it's like, this is not a neighborhood where a normal businessman would want to open a business. That's fine. Um, but for me, a majority, because I'm so far away from everything, um, like Mamba, my, my diners are extremely diverse. Um, but I do want to touch on this cultural appropriation piece for tacos, specifically tacos, because again, it goes back to understanding the threads of where the food came from, who made what, who did what. Just like the hamburger came from Genghis Khan, there's a specific paying homage to things and doing it the right way is, is, is important, right? So there's a certain taco that is very, very, very popular in Mexico. And it's called Al Pastor Tacos. <laughs> Anybody who's ever had an Al Pastor taco, it's a pork taco that cooks on a spit with a pineapple on top. Where the hell did that come from? The Lebanese immigrants that moved to Mexico brought with them shawarma, but they didn't have the same ingredients. So they layered the pork. They don't have oranges anymore. So they put a pineapple on top. And it's a lot of, they didn't have yogurt. So but the marinade and all this, it all was influenced and brought over from Lebanon to, to Mexico, right? And so if I'm making a, a taco and I'm telling, like all the dishes at my restaurant, they tell a story. I know that the dishes at what does, like when I get a piece of this pie, that pie has a story. She can tell a story with every dish. Same thing with Mamba. He can tell you a story about this avocado that's with, with passion fruit and how important passion fruit is to Burundi and its culture. And so if you can tell a story and you can describe and explain how and where you came to this dish, it's okay. But if you're just coming in and saying, this is um, barbacoa tacos, but you really don't understand what barbacoa tacos are and you just bought a seasoning packet and threw it in, you know, people don't consider Rick Bayless a cultural appropriator of tacos. He's not Mexican. He's a white guy. But he spent so much time in Mexico learning about the food, the cuisine. And when he makes it, he makes it from a place of understanding and a place of homage. And he, and he explains and describes, you know, the city of Oaxaca, where this came from, the city of. And so if you can do that, it's not cultural appropriation. But if you're just coming in and doing it the other way, then, yeah, you are culturally appropriating tacos. All right, so just that one question. This will be our last one, the shout outs. Do you have shout outs for other places? Maybe halal places, maybe not halal places in Detroit that you think people should know about that they are not aware of? What the patisserie. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we have to that is the place, you know, and Omar, I think as Omar said, I feel like Omar needs, he needs more support. For, to be honest, he needs more people to visit and to see what he's doing there. He's been there for some time. He opened all these doors for us who was coming after. I mean, I think he deserves uh, this recognition and then he deserves more people to go and to visit him more. That's my two places. Well, when are you going to reopen, Omar? Um, we start, we break ground on our construction this next week. So, you know, I, I've stopped putting reopening deadlines on it, but we do have some really cool things in the works, um, which we'll be announcing soon. And of course, the pop-ups that we've been picking up, we're going to pick up some more. I really want to do um, pop-ups with meaning and not just popping up just to make a buck. It, mm -hmm. I want it to really, truly have some form of uh, integrity. But my two places for shout out, obviously, I'm going tomorrow morning to what of the end bay of Beth, So <laughs> those are my two. But if you want Yasa, if you want Yasa, Maddie's on Grand River. I don't know if they're reopened yet, but definitely a go-to for me. And also, hello.
Yeah, absolutely. Hello. Yeah. And they, they do, they have excellent West African food, <laughs> slightly different from what mama has. Well, listen, I cannot thank the three of you enough, uh, both for the work you do. I, I don't think any of you gets, I agree with uh, mama saying that Omar needs more support. We need to be lifting him up more. I, this, this pop-up he did last week for Palestine was a huge success. It meant so much to people in the community. The people who were there were so grateful. Um, I wasn't there, but I know so many people who were, and it meant the world to them. Um, and all three of you are doing amazing things, and you all deserve to be lifted up. So we're so happy that you took the time out to join us this evening. Um, we hope to see you again. I can't wait to eat. I was at Mamba's recently, but I can't wait to be at your place soon, Warda, and yours as soon as it opens, Omar. And uh, thank we, you. Thank you, we thank you for, for everything you're doing for the city of Detroit, and, um, and we wish you health and happiness. Thank you so um, much, Sally. Thank you. Now, I have a little final script I'm supposed to read. I have to get back to it. Um, so I, I again, I thank our panelists for joining us today and contributing to such a robust conversation. For those of you who joined us live, I thank you. And I thank you for your questions. Um, these videos are recorded and they'll be uploaded to Facebook and YouTube. So please check them out if you couldn't stay for the duration of the event or if you missed the first part. Um, we're thrilled to announce that the exhibit is up again and live at the Stamps Gallery in Ann Arbor. So check our, our website at halalmetropolis.org and the Stamps website, and also check our social media platforms to learn more about the hours and, and the exhibit's accessibility. Um, and we look forward to having you join us for the next gallery talk, which will take place in a week from now. Uh, I don't have the date right in my notes, but I guess it's the 24th. Uh, when Anis Rahman, Jamana Sada, and Zaina Reda will sit down with the Halal, Metrop with Halal Metropolis's project manager and U of M alumnus Asma Baban uh, to discuss the motivations um, and uh, the, the activism of young Muslim students on campus uh, uh, who are sort of trying to increase opportunity and space for the practice of Islam on the University of Michigan campus. So um, again, I thank you again for joining us. Um, follow us on social media to know when the next event is going live. And we wish everyone in our audience uh, to the safety and health. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.